We need to talk about Edmund Burke. In fact, we probably need to talk quite a lot about Edmund Burke because as a politics student, his influence is just felt everywhere in our course, whether it's democracy, whether it's conservatism, whether it's the kind of the structure of parliament, uh, representation, his ideas and his legacy is is massive from a political point of view. So I'm just going to fess up right now that there is no way I'm going to be able to cover everything, all the topics, like he's like, this is not a comprehensive assessment of Edmund Burke. But I am going to talk about why he's in, where how his ideas link to conservatism. And I am going to try and cover some of his kind of key concepts. But I do think it would be helpful for you to just head on to Wikipedia or, or find a kind of like a specific Edmund Burke biography video and or, or, or section and, and have a look, look through because he's an amazing guy. Um, you don't have to agree with him, of course. I'm not sure I agree with him. But like in terms of what he achieves and what he says and um, how he has influenced things that come after him, he is he is impressive. And in this video, we are going to be talking about him. We're going to be talking about how his views then impact the conservative view on society, and how his conservative and how his views impact the conservative view on the state. And he is also, if I flip across now to the other screen, he is also known as the father of conservatism. So just as John Locke was known as the kind of the grandfather of liberalism, Edmund Burke is the um, the father of conservatism. Now I can hear you go, hang on a minute, we just spent uh, half an hour listening to you talking about um, Thomas Hobbes. You did. Um, and Hobbes is is kind of like, he gives the background to conservatism by giving us this view on human nature and developing ideas of social contract. But in terms of recognising what me and you might recognise as traditional conservatism, it's Burke. It's the ideas get far more kind of fleshed out here. Um, and Hobbes's ideas are far more kind of rigid, just looking at certain aspects of the state and authoritarian government and human nature. Um, whereas Burke, as, as said in the introduction, spreads out into huge amounts of different things. And um, conservatives, even today, see him as a very important figure, which many of their ideas are drawn from. But not all of them, and we'll come back to that. Um, in future videos. Now, Edmund Burke is a member of parliament um, in the, oh gosh, I've forgotten the date. Let me just look it up. Edmund Burke is a member of parliament who lives from 1729 to 1797. So he's, he's about 100 years or so after Hobbes, and he is an MP. Uh, Wikipedia, don't let me down. Don't know, can't find it. He's a member of parliament. And um, he's alive at the same time as the French Revolution. Now, in the introduction that I put on the core ideas of conservatism, I believe I said that conservatism is, main, is often seen as a reaction to liberalism. And many of Edmund Burke's ideas come into reaction to the French Revolution, which was taking place at the same time, Les Miserables, all, all that kind of stuff. And... Um, you have to kind of, again, look at Burke in the lens of that. And his most famous work was called something like Reflections on the French Revolution. I might not have the phrasing uh, completely correct there, but, you know, it was a book about what he thought about the French Revolution. And he throws out in that lots of conservative ideas about how the revolution has brought instability, the revolution has taken away people's freedoms, the revolution has um, just has uh, has destroyed the traditions of the society. And he argues that this is going to fragment society um, and leads to disaster, because he is a conservative and he does believe in tradition, the stability of the state, um, and, and so on. But he introduces a very important idea into conservatism, which some students forget. Now, the I, I probably said this in the, in the first video, is, uh, is that many people can see, see conservatism as the kind of like, let's keep things the same ideology. Like the no ideology, I've sometimes called it in class. You know, liberalism says, let's do this. And conservatism says, no. And socialism says, you know, let's make everyone equal. And, and conservatism says, no. And, and it, it's often the ideology that is calling for the status quo, for things to remain the same, for, um, for, for, for the, the, the continuation of the ruling classes or the, or the ruler, whoever that might be. So, so it, it is often the ideology that, 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 that 
doesn't want change. However, Edmund Burke introduces a, a key concept to conservatism, which, is, which explains why conservatives sometimes seem to do very surprising things, which is he introduces this idea of change to conserve. And what this concept means is, is that Burke believes that British government should continue along with its traditions and its values and its, and its hierarchy. But in order for that to continue or to be conserved, sometimes it must change. So take a, take a school, for example, or, or take a business. You might want to keep that business going. You might want to keep that school going. But there comes a point where certain bits of it seem old fashioned, seem out of date or other things are better. So in order for that business or school to keep going, it has to change. So in order to keep 90 percent of the, the thing the same, you have to change that 10 percent. So an example here from Burke's life is perhaps um, slavery. He's anti-slavery. He sees it as unsustainable with, along with his um, with, with his values. And in when, one of the future slides, I'll show you some of the significant changes that conservatives have brought, which seemed almost counter to their kind of beliefs of tradition, stability, hierarchy, organic society, um, or, or authoritarian government. But it's not a contradiction because of the ideas of Burke. Change does happen slowly, when necessary, to survive. And here is one of his key quotes. A state without the means to change is without the means of its own preservation. And what he's saying here is that if a country or a state cannot keep itself up to date, cannot reflect what is happening in the country, it will die. It will be destroyed. Now, context, 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 people. Edmund Burke lived at the time of the French Revolution and the American Revolution. He had seen two countries that had not kept up to date with the views of the people and there had been revolutions. First, the American War of Independence and secondly, the, um, the French Revolution. In both cases, it perhaps could be argued, maybe not, um, that if the, the governments had been more responsive to the people, had been more responsive to uh, how society was changing, they would have survived. But they were states without the means to change and therefore they were without the means of its own preservation. So Burke is arguing strongly here that conservatives, who by their very nature wish to conserve, conservative, conserve, conserve means to keep things going, that they have to be willing to change in certain circumstances. They have to be willing to put changes through when necessary. And I want to hammer this point because it's something that strong students can get a lot of mileage out of. He also believes in something called noblesse oblige, which is French. He didn't actually use this term. This term kind of came later. And you might, if we, if we look at this words and try to work out what it might mean, noblesse oblige, what does it look like? Well, noble, noblesse is, or noblesse, is nobles. And you might know that a noble is a bit like a, a, a knight or a baron or a, an earl. I probably misuse those terms, but, you know, upper classes. And oblige looks a bit like oblige as an obligation as in duty as in something you must do so putting these two words together we end up with the kind of the upper class duty now he is arguing remember he doesn't use this phrase but we can attribute it we can attribute the ideas to him he is arguing that the upper classes have a duty to protect the lower classes and the poorer classes um, firstly, because they are part of uh, one society, uh, an organic society, but we'll come back to that when we look at One Nation. But secondly, if they don't, they will face revolution. You know, and we can see the ideas of Hobbes here. Um, we are in a state of war. The government exists to kind of prevent this kind of state of war. And so Burke is kind of being very practical, very pragmatic here. Now, just sorry, as a, as a little aside, you will, if you watch my first video on conservatism where I go through the core ideas of conservatism, you will see so many of them coming up in the ideas of Burke. This is why he's the father of conservatism and not Hobbes. 
because actually when you look at those core concepts, you can kind of go, oh yeah, that's Burke, that's Burke, that's Burke, that's Burke, that's Burke. Oh, that's Hobbes and it's Burke, you know, type thing. And um, so he's arguing here that there is this kind of duty between the, the upper classes and the, the lower classes, that there must be some sort of um, protection, a, a paternal instinct, a paternal caring, you know, not, not a maternal instinct, you know, kind of like, oh, no, are you okay? But a paternal instinct, father-like, more disciplinarian, but also protective and um, with heart and with compassion where, where, where needed. Um, and that, again, is a significant change, whereas perhaps previously the, the lower classes had been more left to kind of fend for themselves, which had led to unrest in certain countries and, and threatened um, war. Remember, of course, Burke is living at a time where the English Civil War is probably very much in recent memory. Um, and he, he's thinking, how, how can we keep our country stable, especially when other countries around the world are falling apart? Now, in, just to give him some massive credit here, other than the English Civil War, where we had this kind of bizarre situation where you had a civil war and then almost kind of went back to what you had beforehand afterwards, um, most countries have had some, some sort of hard reboot at some kind, at some point, which is why most countries have a constitution. Um, the American Civil War leads to the constitution, the French Civil War leads to their kind of constitution. You know, most countries at some point have some sort of massive civil war, the whole country gets kind of reset and started again. Think, think Russian re Revolution, think, think China's revolution under, under Mao. We don't have one, which is why we've talked about in, in, in our very first unit of politics, we talked about the, the English constitution being an ev evolutionary constitution. It changes slowly over time rather than having this kind of big reset point. And maybe we can thank Burke or blame Burke for that because he introduces these ideas and argues passionately for these ideas that the state needs to change to guard the poor. And I, I realize I'm laboring this point, but I, th I think it's an important one. Um, you know, we, perhaps this is why we have never had that big reset point. Because actually the British state has always, at the points where it started to get most fragmented, has adapted, changed, um, shown some sort of kind of duty um, or maybe we're just very British and we don't do that kind of thing. Who knows? Um, but he is the father of conservatism. He believes in society. He believes, and, and he believes that we, you know, we are all the same society. We, 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 we have the same traditions. We have the same religion. And these are the things that bind us together. And one of the reasons why he is not a liberal, and one of the reasons he is scared of liberal ideas when you look at things like individualism, is that he argues that we we have these bonds between us, not in a socialist sense where it's like we're all one community and we should be equal, but in terms of society, tradition, and religion. We have these same values. And that is so important for keeping our country and our society together. And he argues that rather than a social contract, which is like that, the, the, the idea that there's a kind of a contract between the government and the people, he argues instead for almost like a living contract, which is that society is a contract between the dead, the living, and yet born, which for just for a second sounds like the, the beginning of a, of, a, of a bad zombie movie, although, to be honest, I'd watch that film. But what he's saying here is that Traditions and values and religious values are passed down from those who have lived before us, between us now and those who will come after us. And he's saying that, that these bonds go through time. And it is these bonds and it is these values that is the contract between the dead, the living and the and the yet born and so we can put these two bubbles here the orange bubble and the gray bubble kind of together to see that he is thinking he is arguing that this is how we have stability in our society interestingly though and i need to read some more about this just so i can kind of fully understand it myself he's a fan of the french Re of the u.s revolution but not necessarily such a fan of the french revolution and and in fact he hates the french revolution um, he's, he's undecided for a while and he actually writes, you know, I'm un, as a British man, I'm unsure of how to, to feel at the moment. But
But he eventually becomes very, very anti the French Revolution. And part of that is the fact that the French Revolution, um, you, you may well be aware, destroyed the upper classes, like, like literally murdered them, you know, went from like rich house to rich house, kind of killing them and, and kind of throwing their things out. And, 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 and then it removed people's freedoms and kind of imposed a kind of a, attempted to impose a kind of a, a kind of regimented society. Um, and so he argues that the outcome of the US revolution and the outcome of the French revolution are very, very different. And uh, he's far more in favor of one um, than the other because the, the, the it, may, it might be because the US revolution in fact was removing uh, an oppressive government, i.e. us, um, and the French revolution was, was a civil war to remove its own government. So that they are different. Um, but it's interesting that he, sees one as as moving towards a more stable society and government and the other one is seeing as moving towards a less society stable and government and he even resists attempts uh, when when the english government at one point begins to, begins to try to to negotiate with the new french government he says kind of said no 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 don't get involved in these guys you know, they're 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 oppressing their own people they are um they're bad changing topic Again, I can't do Burke justice. He talks about so many different things and he, you can use him in so many different places in different essays that he, he's, he's like probably the key um, conservative thinker, especially on the traditional side. Now, many ideologies have this end goal of what a perfect world should be like. You know, a liberal view, you know, freedoms, rationalism, democracy, equality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, I, I realize I just keep putting my bruise on the screen, which I know is disgusting. I play paintball with some students and I got shot. So if you're watching this next week, you'll be like, I remember that. If you're watching this in a couple of years time, you'll be like, he got shot. Yeah. By a girl paintball. I've got a back there. Um, but she doesn't have a bruise. So I guess I lose. Um, anyway, sorry. Ideologies have this like perfect end goal. I think the world should be like this. Socialism has this idea of, oh, if only we were all kind of equal and dependent on each other in this wonderful community, the world should be like this. Anarchists, oh, the world, if we take away the state, we'll be free, blah, 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 blah. He calls those philosophical abstractions, you know, like philosophical meaning to kind of, as in like thinking, abstractions meaning like something removed from where we are now, abstract rather than kind of real. And he says, this is disaster. This is disaster. Do, by, by believing in this ideological thing, you're going to be impractical. You're, you're going to throw away our society, our traditions, our religions, etc., etc., etc. So we need to kind of look at this, this idea of change in combination with this idea of philosophical abstractions leading to disaster. You know, he is not coming in and saying, oh my God, we need to change everything. He's not. He's saying keep things the same, except where we absolutely have to kind of make adjustments to keep our society and our country um, um, together. And so he is very against idealistic thinking, ideology, if you want to kind of go that way. Which interestingly puts him in contrast to the new right when we study them in a few videos time. And lastly, before we start to look at society and the state kind of together, um, He's also known as some of the sometimes the father of um, kind of British democracy in a way, because he argues for a representative democracy that uses the trustee model. Now, you may remember last year or earlier this year, you may remember that in the past we talked about different models of representation from MPs. We talked about the, the trustee model, the delegate model and the party model. Like, how does an MP make decisions? Do they make decisions because of which party they belong to? because of where they've been voted in from or do they make decisions based on what they think their own wisdom their own ability to to rationally kind of make decisions and trustee model is often known as burkean representation because burke believes that mps once they have been entrusted trustee entrusted with the people's consent they need to use their own wisdom and experience to make decisions for the good of their constituents. Um, so we can see his fingerprints all over um, British modern conservative or British traditional kind of conservative. Um, I feel like this video has got a little bit long now, so I was going to go into um, the society and the uh, state. 
um, but I think I'll put them in a separate video just to kind of keep things um, kind of snappy. So uh, uh, check out the next video and I'll go, go through these ideas. But what we're, bas what we're basically going to do now is we're going to take Burke's ideas, Hobbes' ideas, put them together, and you can see then what the conservative idea of society looks like and what the conservative idea of the state looks like. And then after that, which is very, very exciting, we're going to have a brand new thinker, which isn't even on the spec, because I think it's important to put a new guy in, which is going to be Disraeli. So if you like this video, then don't forget to like it. And if you sub to it, then sub the video as well. Just hit the subscribe button. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye.